So please welcome Stefan, Sebastian, Eric, and Jeremy to the stage. Today, as a, as a panel, we're, we're setting up to be somewhat heretical, meaning we're going to say some uh, perhaps controversial kinds of things. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and I wish I knew how to deal with uh, people in the audience who are hecklers, but I don't really. Um, so the, as we've worked with businesses, and I'm Eric Hillebrand, I'm the CEO of Brainstems, one of the things that we've heard over and over again is that, um, is that many people are fond of saying data is the new oil. And, uh, but, but what really bothers me about that statement is that oil is a commodity. And what a commodity means is it's a basic raw material, and there is, regardless of source, it's all the same. You can think about pork bellies or sugar or wheat. Those are commodities. And, and, and there's no differentiation between commodities. It becomes very hard to differentiate between commodities. And, and as a result of that, when it comes to pricing a commodity, it's, the pricing of a commodity is based on supply and demand. Now, it, it, as we think about the Web3 community building a data economy, the vast amounts of energy and venture capital is going to be spent trying to take a commodity, data, and figure out the unique value and try to communicate that unique value so you can somehow increase demand and from that then um, regulate supply. But the problem with that is that if all data is the same, or relatively the same, then it's going to be very hard to figure out how to differentiate the product that you have so that you can describe the unique qualities. So when people are talking about data as the new oil, what they're essentially t doing is talking about building a commodity market. And that's a very hard thing to, thing to do. And I think for the Web3 community, the question is, should we really be focused on building a commodity market? Or are we thinking about the wrong part of the value chain? So what is intelligence, and what is the outcome of an AI process? Is that oil? Is it a commodity? Or is, um, is there greater value if we think about an intelligence economy? And what exactly does an intelligence commodity economy mean? Oil is turned into things like plastics. It's turned into things like uh, resins or pharmaceuticals. And that's high value. It's higher margin. It's, it's more valuable in the value chain. And so plastics are not a commodity, and compared to raw oil, there's, uh, it has higher utility, higher value, higher margins. And so if the data economy is about selling a commodity, the intelligence economy is about extracting the higher value and higher margins, similar to the way plastics are highly differentiated from oil. And so today, what we want to focus on is the difference between a data economy and an intelligence economy. Are they different structurally? Are they different technically? Are the business models different between an intelligence economy and a data economy? And, and fundamentally, are, are, are the economics associated with data and intelligence co commodities the difference? So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to our panel, first of all, to introduce themselves, and then start off with a, with a question, which is, are the... Are, are, do you think about the data economy and the intelligence economy as different, as the same? And if they are different, how are they different? And how do you think about how you approach the intelligence economy as opposed to the data economy? Thank you. Thank you for everything. Um, yeah, so my name is Jeremy. Uh, I am the business operations lead at a company called Hyperbolic. Um, so we are building what we call the open access AI cloud, um, consisting in tackling three main goals. Goal number one, which is the classic kind of like deep in, you know, uh, approach um, of, you know, um, harnessing, you know, GPU orchestration layer uh, from idle GPU resources, you know, across the globe and from different kinds of sources, data centers, uh, on-prem machines, individual machines, but also mining farms. Um, and building services on top of this, we have multiple differentiators compared to uh, existing companies in the sectors that uh, I'll be willing to talk a little bit later on. And then number two is verification. How can we have a fully verifiable AI pipeline 
pipeline from compute, the proof of compute, down to the proof of inference, including proof of training, proof of fine tuning, etc. Um, and for this, we created a research paper called Proof of Sampling that is actually tackling this problem and sort of like this best balance between OPML and ZKML with very high security, but also very high, you know, um, uh, scalability uh, with a minimum overhead. And number three is uh, the problem of data privacy that we're also tackling. And it's basically, you know, saying that in the case of a user getting to use the compute of a third party node on our network, um, doesn't necessarily want to have a copy of the data being kept on the third party node machine. And so for this, we're implementing what we call confidential computing uh, through the use of, you know, trusted executed environments. And happy to dig in a little bit more about this later on. Hi, my name is Stefan. I'm CEO of Akave. We're an L2 uh, data layer that is enabling users to store and bring their off-chain data sets on-chain. It delivers full end-to-end -end data provenance. Why is that important? It's important because if you want to demonstrate or guarantee um, you know, data integrity or chain of custody for uh, the data sets that were generated and maybe monetized uh, over time, that they were truly you know, the original and that they were actually um, contributed to by the user that, that stored them. So uh, we're currently built on Falcoin and uh, we are focusing on decentralized AI workloads, um, any use case that is looking to enable on-chain data sets and really cares about data integrity and, and data provenance. Marvelous. Hi there, I'm Sebastian. Uh, I'm part of the investments team at Faculty Group. Uh, Faculty Group is a, a Web3 VC, uh, but we try, as it says in the name, to be uh, more than just a fund. So under the group umbrella, we have a marketing company, a market maker, a token incubator, an advisory, and a dev shop. So we try to get very involved in the, the companies that we, we work for. Happy to talk to any of you at the end about the projects that you're building. Always keen on uh, uh, learning more. Uh, in terms of, uh, of, of the data economy, uh, for us, to keep it simple, um, there has to be value in what you're producing, it has to be, uh, there has to be integrity in the, in the data which you're producing, and it has to be something which people would want the data of. Like, I don't want to know how often you go to the bathroom if I'm not building a protocol for toilets. So we have to have something which is um, uh, valuable, and it has to be valuable today and not five years from now, in our view. Yeah, I, know, so I didn't address the question, but you asked, uh, yeah. you know, data intelligence versus data economy. I think we've already made the transition to a data intelligence uh, economy. Why? Because... Uh, data is the new oil has been used 10 years ago. Uh, I was saying that when we were um, releasing a distributed object store where it was all about monetizing your data and it's proven that that model did not work, in my opinion. And it's only until now that we've seen more uh, ways to, to incentivize users to actually contribute more intelligence around the data in uh, more efficient ways enabled by our crypto tokens. Um, and we can give some examples that one, there has been more uh, high quality uh, data and metadata with it, which is sort of like the first or low level intelligence um, that's being captured at the edge. There's a few deep end solutions that focus on that. And two, um, just the marketplaces right now that are coming online are no longer just focusing on here's a data set because you made a comment about oh, we assume that all data is equal. I disagree with that, obviously, um, because it is assuming that anyone who captures um, a picture of a car, or whatever that is is, 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 is capturing it in the same way. Um, and so I think we've already made that transition, um, definitely in Web3, because we're seeing new business plans that are completely um, vertically integrated that really driving towards intelligence. I think there's still a lot of gaps obviously, that we have to go fi fix. And I think it's great to see confidential computing, um, on-chain data lakes that we provide and investors here that kind of support that strategy, but more than happy to talk about that. I agree. Uh, all data is not equal, especially when you include synthetic data in, in, in the mix. You know, it's, it might be at some point, maybe in the future, it will be something that we can discuss. Just for people who don't know, it's basically the data that's created by the AI. Um, and it's, it's been a, a major question specifically due to the fact that we're, you know, coming to a point where we're lacking data for the next generation of the, the, the next, you know, big LLMs, et cetera. Um, on my point of view, I mean, um, I do believe that intelligence economy, I do believe that data is crucial. Obviously, it's, you know, the source of all of it. That being said, the real value gets unlocked when it's applied to AI, to machine learning. Um, and so I 
truly believe in the power of intelligence economy and the fact that you know um, everything gets to become much more powerful whenever it's being ab able to being deployed in the services that you know cloud can can cater to, such as like inference, um, you know, as well as you know like fine tuning, training, etc. In order to really get there and really you know get to um, offer to you know, the AI developers, the capabilities that they need in order to fuel the, you know, the projects and, and the, sorry, the, the products that we're all using, you know, today on a daily basis, uh, fueled by AI. Do you think the issues of, of provenance are different when it comes mm -hmm. to the data economy or trust is different between the data economy and the intelligence economy? That's a great question. Um, um, I think... It totally, well, it's, a, it's a necessity, the data, I mean, right now, most of the solutions don't have full end-to-end -end data provenance. That's already a big challenge right now because if you look at how and where data is being stored, it is still stored in the cloud or on-premises. And so some central entity has control and an ability to change, even though they may not do it, um, it, it is it is happening, right? And so the government at any given moment, like yesterday I ran um, a full track at the uh, Falcon Dev Summit about decentralized AI, compute mm -hmm. and storage. And so there's a couple of trends that came out of it. One is um, users don't feel comfortable with central entities, even though, mm -hmm. because of two reasons. One, the government could come in at any given moment and say, I want information from that user, mm -hmm. right? And so as an entity, you are sort of obliged to do that. If you cannot do that, because you technically do not have access to it because of the, the encryption, the, the you know, distribution, and um, so th then you can sort of like take away the liability and you can put the control and the liability back into users' hands, which is what the community wants. And that today is not fully integrated in the traditional workloads, uh, plus a lot of the new workloads where you were mentioning where the intelligence is actually coming from because it's more than just capturing new data sets. Um, it's also about creating new data sets. Like the synthetic data sets is the second point that came out yesterday is that we're actually, we actually have a shortage of data or accessible data today. And so what is happening is the, the focus now is on creating more intelligent synthetic data sets to then use that to train new models to get better insights or better models. So now you have this sort of like engineering um, exp you know, challenge where it's all about like how well can you craft you know, synthetic data sets with existing models. And that there's intelligence in that as well. Mm -hmm. And so how do you capture that? You know, the weights of the model that you use, the, the, you know, the, the, the basic uh, inputs that you use, like the actual data sets to start it. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is because you're asking me, is there a difference? Absolutely. One, uh, there is a gap in general in technology today to actually ensure end-to-end -end data provenance, which is what we're solving for, which is also why we're building what we're building. Two, the alignment with the new workloads um, that you were referring to, like decentralized AI, is truly happening. And, and it's more than you know, capturing the data in new ways. Um, it's also about creating the data in new ways, and then the intelligence around it um, is, is very difficult because it's about metadata. <clears throat> it's a combination of multiple endpoints, but in general, it's like the weights of the, the machine learning models. But it's also like, for example, when you capture data at the edge, let's say we take Dymo, you know, is collecting data sets in the car, right? Your driving behaviors and all that stuff that gets shared. Um, there's a lot of like smaller metadata you know, data points that are being captured and being able to correlate that with maybe the traffic information that you have or the street outlines of that city where you were driving, that to me is where the intelligence really happens. So it's a long answer, but um, so yeah, there's still a lot of stuff that needs to be figured out. So to me, it doesn't even exist in a lot of ways, the end-to-end -end provenance in the data market. So one of the things that, that, that we've found is that, that when we, is that, um, we don't want to sell to CIOs, CTOs, or technology entities that are technology buyers. We want to sell to people who have, or businesses that have, have a business problem. And we provide a solution to it. And when we talk about data, people will say, I don't really care about the underlying data. I don't even really care about the algorithms. I just want you to solve my fill in the blank, mm -hmm. blank problem. And with that comes two questions. One question is, where did the data come from? Or where did, what's the source of this 
federation, if we have multiple, multiple entities right. contributing to it? And then how do I make sure that all of the entities contributed in an equal, equal way so that when I'm buying, I'm buying a solution, an AI solution that comes from multiple different, that has multiple different in, inputs in, into it, which is a totally different conversation, I think, than can I buy a bunch of data from you? Totally. And, yeah. and, and so what, how do you think about that, that, that problem? Do you want to? No, go ahead. Yeah, you can talk, <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Or, uh, no, I, 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 feel, I think you're right. It's, it's completely different than selling data sets that um, are sort of commodity, like you said. It's, it's a lot harder for users to even put a, a value to that. And I think um, when you're solving a real problem for their needs, like that are, that's why, for example, if you have a vertically integrated solution, like take a Hive Mapper, right? They're, they're um, selling dash cams to map um, the planet, and they're doing more, much more than selling the, the maps themselves. They're providing AI, AI, like they're actually providing services on top of that, right? with actual insights that you can purchase. And so there's a lot more value there because users can come in with specific needs and actually ask for specific problem statements to be solved instead of um, doing all the effort themselves because they may not have the resources, they may mm -hmm. not have the actual know-how on how to actually get to that point, but they're more than happy to pay for it if you're, like you said, uh, solve for them the fastest path to, I don't know, uh, a certain location, or that may be the, the simplest uh, example. But um, yeah, absolutely, and I think that's a lot more valuable, and you can demand a higher price for it because there's not a lot of, of alternatives right now. There's a lot of alternatives in you know, buying data sets, but um, it, the, actually people that know how to run these models, call, you know, aggregate all these data points, that's still like, still early stages in my opinion. Seb, if you think about the allocation of capital, um, allocation of capital into the data economy or into the intelligence economy, or how do you think about those as one and the same or different or? Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good question. I think um, for us, when we talk about any, infrastructure which would use uh, tools within that economy, the first question that comes to mind is how necessary is it? How long will it take before people start to use it? How long will it take for people to start to engage in the ecosystem? And so, you know, I've been in Brussels now since Sunday. I've had back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back, uh, coffees with people. I'm having that for the rest of today and tomorrow, although I think I'll be a little hungover from the England game. Hopefully we can beat the Netherlands, but we'll, we'll see. Um, but so often it's infrastructure that they're building, and the question comes after 15 minutes of technical spiel about what's being built. That's great. <laughs> Who's buying it? And often there's a sort of a pause, and there's a scratch of the chin, and they go, well, that's a really good question. And then there's this sort of discussion of, of uh, there's like an invention of the ideal demographic, the ideal target customer, the person that would buy this data set, or the company that would buy this data set. And then when you ask, does that company exist at the moment? Often, not always, often, the answer is no, but there definitely will be. Now, that is exciting, but when it comes to the question of allocation of capital, we really need to know when that time comes. If the time is right now, and the, the customer is, uh, is here, and they're buying the data set, or perhaps they have been for a year, 10 years, five years, whatever, that's immediately exciting, but some funds, most funds, aren't willing to wait many, many years for those clients and those customers to uh, become apparent. So um, we have to be very cautious. Uh, we have to think about uh, the, the customer, because it's nice to say we have this huge data set, but if no one's gonna do anything with it, from a venture point of view, just from a venture point of view, that's not immediately exciting. Sorry to break anyone's hearts. <laughs> <laughs> You were gonna... Yeah, no, c coming back to, um, to the earliest points um, and the difference between uh, you know, data economy and, uh, and, and uh, intelligence economy. So I, I, you know, usually what's happening in the business model around uh, data economy is that it's mostly going to be focusing on data acquisition, on storage, and sales. Mm -hmm. Um, whenever we're, gonna, we're talking about intelligence economy, it's basically entering sort of like this new world of, you know, um, making sure that we can unlock this power, as, as, as told before, um, in solving problems, as you mentioned, for businesses, whether it's like in terms of their strategy, in terms of efficiency, you know, thanks to the power of AI, and in whichever way it is. Like, there are some use cases that have been, you know, um, 
been used uh, so far, which is you know uh, mostly DLLMs, and we get to interact with with it on a daily basis. Uh, but we're 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 still you know far from being struck with you know video generation, for instance, that is going to be unlocking a whole new set of interesting things in the intelligence mm -hmm. economy and shifting you know a lot of industries such as the movie industry. I'm, I'm I live mm -hmm. currently in Southern California, nearby LA, and I'm I'm interacting with a lot of people in the industry, and everyone is dead scared about how it's going to be, uh, you know, changing their, mm -hmm. their life. I do believe that it's actually more so of like an augmented intelligence, but this is another topic. Um, so yeah, so basically the fact that, you know, it's, it's uh, this shift between this really core concentration on data acquisition, sales, and, and storage to sort of like, you know, uh, building uh, a new um, sort of like business model uh, in order to really unlock the value of the data and making it ap applicable to, to uh, basically change, you know, the, the, the strategies and the efficiencies of the world we live in. Well, that was going to be my, my next question, which is around the business model. One of the things that, that I believe is that that when it comes to monetization strategies, that there is a very distinct difference between monetization when you're thinking about a data economy and monetization when you're thinking about intelligence. And that then transfers into pricing, how you price in a data economy, how you price in an intelligence economy. And so the business models, in my view, are fundamentally different. Does, do any of you want to take a stab at either supporting that statement or throwing me out uh, uh, and, 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 and disagreeing with it? We'd love to hear your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think my opinion is that if you're talking about a data economy, and as I said at the very beginning, it, it's, it's a commodity. I mean, we can argue about whether this data set's better than that data set, but for most businesses, the people who have checkbooks, unfortunately, they're not making decisions at that, at that particular level. And so it really is around, I mean, I, I can't tell you the number of people that I've, business people I've talked to, why do you buy this data? Well, I, I buy it because if I don't buy it, and, I, and it turns out that that data is not, um, uh, and I, somebody finds out that I didn't purchase it, everybody else in the industry purchases data, I don't believe it's valuable, but I have to purchase it because everybody else does it. That's not a compelling value proposition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see, I see. I see your point. I think right now, like what you're seeing, and this is the beauty of tokenomics or, you know, incentives that you can build with, um, with, with tokens, is that you can go way more granular in the incentives you want to drive to get faster to the intelligence that you need. And I think that's where you're getting to. It's like, mm -hmm. in, in the past, it's more like, oh, here, I've got some data sets. It's a big bulk data set. You can buy it. Uh, right, right now, it's like, no, no, no. What I want to know is where was this uh, like, for example, I'm, I'm working on a side project with a, uh, an astronomer on a telescope uh, co uh, project where one of the challenges that satellite companies um, want to track their own satellites. And the challenge is they have like three telescopes. It's the side business. I mean, really side business. It's a necessity to like track their satellites. It's very surprising that they're doing that. But the point is what they want is actually their satellites being monitored at all times across the globe from different angles and being able to actually get the intelligence. Just like where was my satellite at this point? And also they want to track competitor satellites, mm -hmm. right? So it's also a security thing. But the point is that if you have a token that where you can say, I want someone to spin up some telescopes, set them out in South Africa, right? Because I don't have, you know, observations. I don't have observers there. And by the way, it's like a perfect location because the night sky is and it's all dark and I would have perfect visibility. And so then you can really say, I will give a higher yield to those uh, telescope providers. And so you can be more efficient. And then you can say these telescopes will capture the following metadata, right? So they, what the, the locate, not only the GPS coordinates, obviously, but there's other high quality or low quality data sets that you're willing to pay for. And so that is being very intelligent also from the, like what you were saying, the first stage, which is like, I need this kind of data set. I need to go capture this data set. I'm already defining what my value is and I'm gonna incentivize all the way till the end point. And then not only that, I'm gonna incentivize them when I'm using it. And so that is new, and I think that is what your point is, that we have come now to a stage where we can actually, we actually have more tools, and also we can enable them um, to like monetize, oh, look, not monetize, but, but really like provide a yield back to the actual creators that helped us get to that intelligence. You couldn't do that if decentralization wasn't a exactly. key part of that. Exactly. I was just going to say, I, I think the, 
the use of, uh, of tokens to incentivize areas which need incentivization is absolutely crucial, especially for kickstarting a, a project and a, an ecosystem. The problem that we sometimes find, and we've seen this all over the place with DeFi, is the second those incentives run out, because something just isn't sustainable, um, a lot of the users, a lot of the people that are selling the data in DeFi, you know, a lot of the TVL, it just dries up immediately. So I think with any project that's looking to, to operate in a decentralized way and incentivize people using tokens, um, if they rely on, on the sort of, um, if they rely on tokens too much and those early incentives, the second those go away, and, and they will eventually, uh, or at least they'll, they'll move somewhere else comparatively, um, that can kill a project. So uh, people think when they're building that we can just incentivize with our huge treasury or our huge uh, community uh, incentives, but eventually those will dry up, uh, and one has to give real yield and real benefit to users, or otherwise they'll go elsewhere. Yeah, and so uh, I agree with, with your point. Uh, and I think there's a lot of projects that definitely we have learned from because you're right, they're very focused on, they're focused on the supply, right? And they're like, okay, we need supply up and demand will come. But there's ways where you can incentivize the demand as well, where you can say, hey, you're a contributor. If you're providing this, you know, this request, you actually will get a yield back because you're participating in the ecosystem. And that's still where uh, I see projects like trying to figure out what's the right balance between the supply and, 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 and the demand. Um, and you see this in Web2 as well, right? You get, you know, marketing dollars, credits basically, uh, for to, you give those credits back to partners for partners that are selling your stack. So future credits in return for promoting and selling current software stacks. And so I think we should take a little bit of that Web2 world in that sense where we should look at more the demand side because otherwise you're getting into a situation where you run indeed out of, out of tokens and then what? You know, if you didn't make it in that time frame. So th there are some projects that are now um, only growing, that are only growing the supply as the demand comes in, mm -hmm. right? So there's a lot more focus on like what is that demand actually yeah. look like and you know how can we, it's not easy but obviously it's it's a learning from the last i think 10 years i guess right <laughs> from seeing projects go under and investors also like you know obviously demanding like hey i need to see a sustainable long-term business mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah um i so it's actually funny because there is something we're working on sort of like as a side project that is going to be fueling the main products that we have. So as a recap, it's basically GPU marketplace and inference services for now. And what it is, is basically evaluation services. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with like Chatbot Arena from LMSYS. It's basically a tool that everyone in AI and Web2 is craving for, which is basically providing the tools to humans <coughs> to provide feedback feedback, sorry, on different types of models. So let's say that you're typing a prompt, you have model A and model B, that can be GPT-O, 4O, sorry, and like Gemini 1.5. Um, you're gonna, you don't know which model is model A, model B, and as a human, you'll get to, you know, basically decide which one is best in terms of providing the, the answer to your, to your response. And basically the thing is, you get to provide this, and this is in a way one of the fastest paths to a simulation of AGI because when you're doing it for open source AI models, you can get access to the weights and biases, and then you can create sort of like a leaderboard with subcategories saying, oh, for coding, um, we realize with one million human votes that actually, I don't know, Llama 3 is better than mm -hmm. X or Y, like Mistral, for instance. Um, and so what is very interesting with this is we spoke with a lot of researchers that are contributing to it, and they're like, they're frustrated because it's, you know, it's just thumbs up, you, thank you for participating to the community, but it's nothing. And so that's where we're trying to bridge Web3, where we're building, you know, similar things with rewards, basically, and offering, you know, incentivization mechanism to anyone, to any humans participating to it in order to, to leverage this. So I think it's, it's basically where Web3 is, you know, also putting, going back onto this conversation, sort of like you know, uh, a really strong power into what AI and Web2 traditional companies are lacking, in a way. Well, we were going to uh, transition to questions, but unfortunately with a panel that has uh, strong opinions, <laughs> uh, we're, we're out of, I've, oh, we have one? Okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Maybe some, some water, maybe. It's so emotional. Um, yeah. Because the first you said that statement was a mathematician who 
Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And he said, it is like the new oil, because it is raw state, it's useless. Mm -hmm. It has to be processed and refined. Its value lies in its potential. Mm -hmm. So as people, we have a tendency to turn every asset into a commodity. So some people think of data as a new oil as, my God, I'm going to make lots of money. And for some reason, that's stuck in the business world when the real meaning has been lost. So I wonder, how do we then change the narrative? Because you're saying the right mm. words. All of you use the word value constantly in the conversation. I guess the question is, how do we change the narrative that, and the story we attach to ourselves that every asset has to be a commodity or has to be thought of as a commodity? Because um, you take the Clive Humby example, it got lost in translation through the years and everybody thought we were going to oil wells and we were going to make lots of money. Mm -hmm. So if we are going to go to an intelligence economy, how do we change the narrative where everybody sees every specific asset as something that can be monetized or is something that is a commodity? Well, if, if, I'm, um, if I'm going to a, a, a business and I'm selling plastic containers that allow me to put my sandwich in and there's a nice air top, airtight top on them that keeps my sandwich fresh, I don't go in and my pitches to, to the person I'm selling to is I don't go in and say, I have wonderful plastic. What I say is I have a way of keeping my sandwich fresh, your sandwich is fresh. Would you like that solution? And I think one of the things that I see is there's, as, as excited as we are on the infrastructure and technology, what we're not very good at is hearing the solution that we're trying to provide to the person who's writing the check. And what we need to do is change our own vocabulary and our own way of thinking and our own way of, of, of conceptualizing so that what we're focused on is what's the end pain that we're solving for the, the customer that has the largest checkbook. And it's not the person who buys the plastic. The person who has the largest checkbook is the person whose sandwiches are getting stale. So, any? No, I, I agree. I just, I'm trying to figure out what is the right narrative you're saying, like, Data is. Right, he's absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. With technology, like I speak to boards all the time, and honestly, guys, they don't care about the tech. Yeah. yeah. This is why. Exactly. Why? What's in it for me? What's the value exchange? Oh, Which is the same for all of us. Mm -hmm. It's also the same for them. So I think when you find it, time, you all use the word brilliantly, which is value, valuable, value, mm. and it's really that translation of value and the value exchange is what turns it from a commodity. I think. I think you know, that's why you're all saying the right things. Mm -hmm. I think I'd, I'd just echo what Eric said, but I'd also add on to, um, to my Welsh friend. You're Welsh, right? I can hear it straight away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard it even through that. Um, I think, to a large extent, seeing is believing. And so you were talking about boardrooms, right? I think sometimes there can be a bit of a, like an innovation lag where they hear something on the deep forums of Bitcoin Talk or on crypto Twitter, and they think it's very... Um, Ethereal, I think would be the word. And so when we start to see more use cases and things become more real, and we have solutions, like Eric said, um, all of a sudden people will, all too late, start to go, right, we need to get on this. And they'll realize that actually six months ago they had a meeting when they could have implemented a solution which would have put them ahead. So the, 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 the ultimate alpha is being the first person in that door and being able to make the case that they need to take advantage of it now rather than wait six months when they'll realize, crap, I made a mistake. Yeah, I'd add to that as well. The only thing I would add is they would also be more educated of why they're choosing the things they are. Exactly. Because today mm. they build software to fix software and they don't yeah. really understand the value, but you're right. And before, we, before we get pulled off the, the, the stage by Porter, the, the thing that I would also, <laughs> what I would also say is that um, in the conversations that we're having, it, the, the conversation is, has shifted from the intelligence doesn't exist necessarily outside of, of my enterprise. In other words, what I need in order to create intelligence that's valuable is not necessarily what I can buy that's external, but it's how can I take what I have internally, combine it with what's external, and it's a one plus one is equal to five. Yeah. And so that conversation, which is helping people say, you have native intelligence within your organization. Part of the problem is you don't know how to manage it. This is where it comes into, you know, yeah putting a data lake on the cloud, which yep. you know, becomes very hard when you're trying to now combine my data that's internal with third-party data sets, with my partner's data, with my vendor's data, all of which needs to be pulled together into some, some way. Yep. And I think that that be, also becomes a critical part of, of how you describe the, 
the, uh, the solution? Good question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like yesterday I got confirmed again, like multimodal, like as soon as you start like going, even within a company beyond text, video, audio, and you start just combining it, it that already alone has so many data points. Yeah. And then if you go beyond an entity, yeah, like you said, uh, it, these are all the problems that are currently being discussed, which is at least we are having the discussion, which is awesome because last year, we didn't have that. Right. Deepin on its own didn't have, it was just bubbling up like as a category, but now we're actually seeing, we're starting to see real use cases coming online, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, uh, thanks yeah. everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat>